right. Well, today we're going to talk about what does God hate? How many of you know what God hates? Sin. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? That covers it all, huh? <laughs> God hates sin. Let's... Uh, but today I want to uh, go through it. There is a flyer in your bulletin that um, you can pull out and, and refer to in a few minutes. And it's actually a list of 45 things scripturally that God hates. Um, it, it's more than just the seven in Proverbs 6, but there's at least 45 things that God hates. But we want to read the word first out of Proverbs 6. So if you'll stand with me. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven that are hated by him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that kill those who are without guilt, a heart that makes sinful plans, feet that run fast to sin, a person who tells lies about someone else, and one who starts fights among the brothers. Your Heavenly Father, as we come into this time of your word, I pray that, Lord, that we could look into the mirror of the word of God and be transformed. That, Lord, we'd be strengthened and encouraged by what your word declares. And, Father, that who we are in you would be alive inside of us, Lord. That we would truly examine and search our hearts today for the days ahead of our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. You may be seated. We are 16 days away from the election. Yay! Only 16 more days and it's, this is over. And we have, um, we have voter guides in the information booth, on the information booth table. One is um, about all the propositions that um, are out there. And the other one is about the general election, the presidential election. And, you know, on the presidential election, they just... They, they've asked people a number of questions, candidates a number of questions, and they've told you how they've responded so that you can make the decision. On the proposition ones, they tell you to vote yes or no, and they tell you why to vote yes or no, and it's all detailed in there. This is from the uh, Traditional Values Coalition, and these are the same ones that we hand out every year, so, uh, or every time there's an election. I can't remember how many elections since I've been in this church, but we've been handing them out a long time. So make sure you stop by and get those today at the information booth. And, and I already have my ballot. I'm going to probably vote tonight. Um, I'm going to be done. Uh, <laughs> November 8th, I know when the election comes, we have Prophet John Harkey with us that night. So um, we're going to have a great time of worship and ministry. And uh, we're just going to celebrate Jesus on election night. Amen. And uh, let the prophetic word flow. Um, I believe that we need to weigh the, these election people against the Word of God. I believe that. Some people say, no, you, you know, it's politics and religion, it's two different things. And I've heard pastors say, you know, it's not about that, you know. But I'm of the belief that, you know, I, I want to look for people that are line up more with the Word of God. And, and that's very difficult in these days. And... Um, but we need to be praying, and we need to be seeking God's face. Amen? Uh, we need to be in touch with God and what he's declared. We need to be touch, in touch with God and what he is declaring. Amen? But I want to share with you the definition of hate. These are things God hates. To hate. It, the, the enemy, a foe. It's hateful. It's hideous. It's utterly hateful. That's what hate means there, what God hates. But God also declares that there's a lot of things that are an abomination to him. And when he says it's an abomination, it means that it's, it's properly something disgusting. So there are things that are listed on that page that either God hates or it's utterly disgusting to him. He just can't stand it. And uh, he abhors them, especially idolatry. Um, it's an, abom an abomination to him. So... On that list of 45 things, you know, it, it's going to tell you whether, you know, it's, whether God hates it or it's an abomination to him. So those, that's why I gave you the definition. But before you weigh in on any candidate, before you, you look at this and you say, well, you know, who you should vote for, you, we need to actually, I believe, look into a mirror. I told somebody the other day, I said, there's 45 things that God hates. 
And the person said, could you tell me what they are so I can make sure I'm not doing them? And I thought, absolutely. So I knew I wouldn't be able to talk about all 45, so I gave you a list. So that you can look and say, hmm, go down that list and do a, a, a mirror check. Because they're all scriptures. And you know what? I looked up all these scriptures and, and um, yeah, it's really real. You know, but the thing that I, I do know is that the sins of an individual affect the whole. You can't say, well, I'm doing my own thing. This is not anybody else's issue. I believe the sins of an individual affect the whole. The sins of this church, the people in this church, your sins affect this body. The sins of the people in America affect this nation. I believe that wholeheartedly, that we have that, that kind of effect as we walk in this life. And that, that's why God was so hard on the Israelites. That's why he was trying to keep the, the, uh, the sin out of the camp. He wanted it to, to remain pure. He, and he wanted it to be set apart. He wants them to be holy, amen? Um, so when, when the Israelites went to fight against Jericho, God said, okay, hey, listen, don't take anything out of Jericho. Everything there is an offering to me. Don't take any of the gold, the silver, or nothing. Leave it all there. Well, there was one guy, Achan, and the best way to describe it is in his own words. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, it says, it says I saw, I saw, everybody say, I saw. Among what was left of the city, a beautiful coat from Shinar. I saw, everybody, 200 pieces of silver and a large piece of gold as heavy as 50 pieces of silver. I had a for them and them. See that they are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver under it. So he said, I saw, I desired, and I took it. And as I was reading that passage this week, I said, that sounds familiar. And I went over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And it says, So when the woman, that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to make one wise, she of its fruit and ate, she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Again, saw, desired, and took. And because of what Eve did and Adam, it affected all of mankind. Because of what two people did, it affected all of mankind forever that were on this earth. Two people. Now what Achan did, because he, he, they, they went to the next city and they were going to fight an AI, and that when they went to fight at Ai, they were losing the battle, and Joshua was going, what in the world is going on? Why are we losing, God? We're supposed to roll through this place. And God said, you got sin in the camp. And he said, uh, well, who is it? And, and, and through a pro the process that God gave him, it came that Achan was the guy. And because of Achan, they were losing. Because of Achan's sin, it had an effect on the nation of Israel as a whole that they were losing the battle. They killed him and his family, his animals, everything he owned, they burned it to eliminate it totally and completely. So in the Old Testament, it's kind of like it was to kill them and get the sin out of the camp. That's Old Testament. New Testament, it's not that way. We're not going to kill you today. I'm joking, okay? We're not going to kill you. <laughs> But in the New Testament, it's to repent of your sins, amen? And to turn to the Lord, you know, to, to receive God's grace and, and God's healing so that we're not doing those things, amen? He, he offers repentance to us as the way out. That we can really, and repentance is not just saying, oh, I'm sorry I did that. Repentance is saying, my life is being turned around and I'm not going to do them anymore. I was going this way, but now I'm going to go this way with Jesus. That's what repentance is. It's not just saying I'm sorry. It's an actually act of transformation that takes place in our lives when we repent of our sin. Can I hear an amen? So Jesus had atone, has atoned for our sins, and if we repent and turn to God, we're forgiven of our sins. Amen? So I gave you this list, and let me just touch on a couple of them. And remember, you, 
you can get mad at me if you want, but I didn't write the list. It's the Bible. Okay, and you can look up all those scriptures and you can see for yourself that it's the Bible. So, number one, it's homosexual acts, acts bestiality, idols, uh, blemish sacrifices, worshiping the sun, moon, or stars, divination, astrology, enchanters, witches, charmers, wizards, necromancers, tra transvestitism, um, the hire of a whore, remarriage to a former wife after she has been married to another man. God doesn't like that. Dishonest scales, cheating people, workers of iniquity, the wicked, those who love violence, the perverse, the proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift to running to mischief, a false witness who speaks lies, anyone who sows the scourge among the brethren, lying lips, lying's in there twice. The sacrifices of the wicked, the ways of the wicked, the thoughts of the wicked, the proud heart, those who justify the wicked, those who condemn the just, vain sacrifices, feast as Israel celebrated them, because they celebrated wrongly, robbery for burnt offering, idolatry, evil plans against neighbors, false oaths, Esau, divorce, God hates divorce, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, God didn't like either, and, and um, you shall not set up a pillar which the Lord your God hates, and I hate, I despise your feast days in Amos 5, 22. So when you look at all that and you put all together and you, can, you know, just ask yourself, am I doing any of these things? And as I mentioned about Adam and Eve and aching, seeing desire and desires leads to taking, participating. So what we see becomes what we think. And what we think about leads to what we're doing. What you see, what you desire, what you do, what you take. So, as we walk with God, my desire is to not offend Him. My desire is to keep those things out of my life. And there are things that we can do to help keep them out of our life. Can I hear an amen? But I, I really think that, you know, we need to have this conversation today about this because if we don't have the conversation about what God hates, then we think we're innocent of evil when we're doing it. And, you know, it's kind of like, uh, how many of you ever got a speeding ticket? And, and you say, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Me too. I got two in one week when I was real young. I was like, wow. But, um, you know, when you get a ticket and the officer pulls you over and he says, do you know how fast you were going? They always ask you that. And you say, well, I was going, you know, 45. And he said, well, do you know what the speed is here? Well, the last sign I saw said 45. And he says, well, it changed to 25. Does that matter to him that you didn't see the 25 sign? No. He still gives you the ticket. You think it's going to matter to God that he's given you the word of God and you didn't pay attention to it and then you used to be heaven and say, well, I didn't know? It ain't going to fly. It's not going to work with him. He's going to still hold you accountable to the word of God, so I've got to preach the word of God. Amen? So we're going to talk about the things that God hates and how to get past it. A very simple example. God hates the shedding of innocent blood. God hates abortion. God hates abortion. God hates abortion. Come on, church. God hates abortion! How many of you think the church should hate abortion? How many think our government should hate abortion? Well, I'm here today to tell you the church doesn't hate abortion. Not at all. Not in the least. The church doesn't hate abortion. I'm going to tell you why. Over 40% of women who have had an abortion 
say they were frequent churchgoers at the time they ended their pregnancies. And about half of them say they kept their abortions hidden from church members. So, up to date, see, what's today? Sunday, up to date on Friday, I think. Thursday or Friday, somewhere there. There's been 59,465,177 in abortions. While I've been talking, there's probably been 100 more. So that has happened since Roe versus Wade. So if 40% say they were active church members, that's 23,786,070 abortions that have happened by church members. So, but they found that about 70% of women who had an abortion identified themselves as Christian. 70%. So if you just went about like right down this line right here, that would say all of you have had an abortion and you didn't. That would be about 70%. See, so that's why I say the church doesn't hate abortion because the church is participating in it. See, so when it comes down to, to what does God hate, how much are we really participating in the things that God hates? How much are we saying it's okay, it's all right, I'm, you know, I'm okay with it as long as it doesn't affect me? Let me tell you, it affects you. What is happening in our land affects you. And I truly believe if the church would say no to abortion, my gosh, our country would change. But the church has not stood up and said no yet. Now listen, if you've had an abortion here, it's under the blood of Jesus. Hey, there's nothing we can do about that, amen? I'm talking about from this day forward. I mean, if you've already done this, you know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things on there that it says God hates, and we've probably done a lot of them in our lives. But when we come to Jesus and we repent of our sins, amen, we're forgiven. Amen? So I don't leave here under condemnation because I'm talking to you this way. Because I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but I want you to see where the church has been at. Because we all say, well, you got to vote for this guy. you got to vote for this guy. you got to vote for this guy. Because they, don't, you know, they um, don't believe in abortion. And the church believes in abortion. And the church has got to come correct before we can ever point the finger at a politician and say, well, they don't, they don't believe the way that I do. What do you really believe? Because that's what matters. You've got to look in the mirror first. Am I really living the kingdom of God? Or am I just pointing the finger at some politician and saying, you need to think like I do. But what do you really think? Because this is, we're going to be held accountable for that. So many people, we say one thing, but we're doing another. And we got to break that mold, amen? I mean, we hear the lady share, Desiree, thank you for your openness with us, you know, about the, the miscarried babies. That's a tough thing with Delon, and I experienced that a couple of times. And Man, it's hard. Those are tough things. The church, you know... 76% of the people that, that were in the church said that um, the church had no influence on their decision to have an abortion or not. See, at some time, church, we've, we've got to influence for the kingdom of God. I mean, there's so much, there, you could look at all, I mean, if you look at the 70% who say they're, they're, they're Christians, that accounts for 41,625,623 abortions since Roe versus Wade. So you can't tell me that the church doesn't believe in abortion because we're doing it. But I'm not the church. We are the church. And a hush fell over the room. The survey also found that 64% feel that members of the church are more likely to gossip about their pregnancy or abortion. 26% they expected or experienced judgmental reaction from a church. 26% said they expected or experienced condemnation from the congregation. 
Only 16% said they expected or experienced a caring reaction from the church, while 14% said they expected or experienced a helpful reaction. What does that say about the church? What does that say about us? Are we loving even? The greater answer, the greater, deeper question is the promiscuity of the church. Having sex outside of marriage. That's the bigger question. Why is that happening so much? When are we going to come correct as the body of Christ? I'm hearing so much out there that people pointing fingers at politicians and stuff and when the church is jacked up. We've got to come correct, amen, under God. We say we're one nation under God, and that's what we've got to become, amen. We've got to be the church of Jesus Christ, that we come in and we submit to his way of doing things and his way of being right, that it's not Ron King's way of doing things. I'm only telling you what the Word of God says today. We've got to come alive in it. We've got to teach our children. You don't want to volunteer in children's ministries? Why not? Man, who's going to influence our kids? Your, their schools? Oh, they'll teach them. They'll teach them in first grade how to be a transvestite, how to be a homosexual. They'll teach them all that stuff, won't they, Amanda? We've got to hit it from another way. So what steps can we take to not be offending God? Because that's what matters to me. I don't want to offend God, man. I want to get to heaven, I want to say, whoa, Ron King is here. Come on in. Woo! I don't want it to be, oh, um, who are you? I don't want that. So, I have a few ideas for you today. You ready? Get out your pen, write them down, do them, practice them. Number one, guard the window to your soul, your eyes. Guard the window to your soul. I know, man, I watch TV with Delonda, and we'll be sitting there watching, even just watching the football game, and then the commercial comes on. As soon as the commercial comes on, man, I go, whoop, and I look right at her. Because she's going to be like, are you going to sit there and watch that? Are you going to watch that junk? I'm like, just, just talking about commercials, you know. I'm like, no, ma'am, I'm not. I'm not even looking. I'm not. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I'm just right away, man. I just look at her. Commercials is visiting time, you know. And uh, you know, it's when we mute the TV and, you know, we don't watch. Because commercials on regular television today are obscene. Matthew 6, 22 and 23, it says, The lamp of the body is the... Eye is the eye. Everybody put your finger in your eye. It's your eye. That's the lamp to your, your soul, your eye. If, you, if therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But, but, there's always the but in there. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light... That is, this is really crazy. If the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? See, it all has to do with what we see, with what we look at. Isn't that what happened to Eve? She saw. Isn't that what happened with Achan? He saw. When we, when we look on things, it can develop in us a desire. You know, and so we've got to deal with what we allow in, amen? And, and if we're honest today with each other, a majority of the stuff on TV today is junk. But we have this thought. I can handle it. It's not going to affect me. I called this last week. How much would it cost for me to take out cable and just leave internet? You know, I'm thinking, I just need to get rid of TV. I think the enemy is trying to 
lull us asleep right now. To, to uh, get it so that we think we're strong enough to handle it. But the enemy is just feeding us junk under the table. And it's just coming at us. The enemy's trying to get you to think, oh, you're such a strong Christian. He'll even build you up. You're such a strong Christian. You can handle all this cussing and swearing. And, ah, little nudity won't kill you. You're so strong. That's a lie. That's a lie, amen. We need to be careful. They put side blinders on pack horses. Get my mic in there. They put side blinders on pack horses so that they don't get led astray by what they see. You, you know, it, it's, it's like when you're driving and you get to watching something. You, your car just tends to start going that way. Even though you're not planning to go that way, it's going to what you look at. Where your eyes are, that's where it, you're, you're going. But we need spiritual blinders on, amen, so we don't get led astray, so that we don't think that we're above it, that we can handle it. If we think that we can handle it and that we're above it all, we're setting ourselves up for what? Failure. But if something catches your eye, let's go to number two. Number two is cast down all imaginations and don't let it turn into desire. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down arguments at every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So no matter how hard you try to protect your eyes, you know you're going to see things. Delano always tells me, I feel so sorry for you men. You know, you just, it's, junk is everywhere. So the thing is, not to meditate on the junk, amen? Not to meditate on what you see. Don't allow your imagination to run wild with what you see. Because if your imagination gets in with what you see, it can become desire. Then when it becomes desirable to you, you start thinking about it. It starts coming alive in, inside of you. So we need to capture those bad thoughts, and we need to cast them down, amen? Amen? And it has to happen right away. You've got to go, whoa! <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when you go fishing in a catch and release place. You caught it, you release it. You get rid of it right away, amen? You've got you to let it go. I'm reminded of Joseph when he was with Potiphar's wife, you know. And she wanted him. And he went in there and she's trying to seduce him. And, and you know, Joseph could have hung out and said, well, you know, I shouldn't do, be doing this like, you know, but she hung out, you know, he could have hung out with Potiphar's wife and let her talk and let her tie, and, you know, and just kind of toy with it in his mind and everything. But that isn't what Joseph did. When Joseph was there with Potiphar's wife, he took off and he ran. He's like, I'm out of here. And he put on his sprint shoes and he got out of the house and he got away from it as fast as he could. And we can do that with our thoughts, amen? We can adjust our thinking to put it back on Jesus. We can read the Word, we can worship, we can pray. But Joseph didn't have a Bible. He didn't have any of that. He just knew out of his relationship with God that this was not something that God had for him. So he fleed from it right away. He got away from it as fast as he could. And that's what we need to do in our minds. We need to flee from things that we're seeing so that it doesn't become desire in our lives. We need to cast it down, amen? When I was a youth pastor, they asked me, they said, Hey, Pastor Ron, is it okay if we, uh, if we go to parties where there's drugs and alcohols, if we don't participate in that? Because we like to just go for the music and dance and stuff. I said, Well, I'll answer you next week. So the next week I came back with my answer, and it was, Light does not associate with the darkness. And they said, But Jesus went to parties. I said, yes, he did. And every time he went to the parties, he pulled the people out of their situation. He didn't get pulled into their situation. So if you think you're strong enough to go to parties and pull people out of it, go. But otherwise, don't be around it. 
This young lady stood up. She raised her hand. I said, yeah. Her name was Susie. She said, what about me, Pastor Ron? I said, what about you, Susie? She said, both my parents are alcoholics and they drink all the time. What do I do? My heart was broken for that girl. I remember I called Pastor Dave that night when I got done. I said, you got to let me do a family class or something or a marriage class or something because parents are screwing up their kids. And so that was when we stopped being youth pastor, went back and worked with marriage and family for a season. I felt so, such a heaviness for that young lady, such a desire to help. It's tough stuff. But I do know this. Jesus is the answer to any situation. Jesus. Before we started today, we were in prayer here in the sanctuary, and we just started praying praying the name of Jesus. And it just erupted into worship in the name above every name, the name of Jesus. And that's why it just praise and worship was so powerful because we just, we're entering in before we ever get started. We're just praising the name above every name, the name of Jesus, because that's what matters. But in all, if you see something and have allowed it to turn into desire and have fallen into the trap of the enemy, we need to do number three. Repent of it and stop today. We're not going to take you out and stone you, but you need to let those desires be lifted up to God and repent of them in the name of Jesus. You know, it's James 5, 16, it says, Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. But it says, confess your trespasses so that you can be healed. You confess what, what you've been doing, you get it out. And I know we don't like to tell people, I, talk, I keep talking to Pastor Dave, we've talked about this a number of times, I thought, I'm just going to put in a confessional. I know we're not Catholic, but confess. I'll sit on one side, I'll get Pastor Rob to sit on one side, I'll get Jesse to sit on one side, and we'll just have that time where you could come in and you could unload. See, because we don't want people to know what we've been doing. And that's why they put that little barrier up into that screen that you can't see, so nobody can see who's repenting. But we need to repent, amen, for any of those things that we're doing that are offending God. We need to get it out of our system. Stop doing it, amen. Cast it down, and we need to move forward with God. Confession exposes the darkness to the light. That's why it talks about in John that darkness hates the light because it's afraid of being exposed. I was reading a word yesterday that... Like up to the end, it was given in April that up until the end of October, from May to October, God was going to be exposing things. <laughs> There's been so much stuff exposed in, in the world today. It's crazy. It's more than we could even imagine the things that are being exposed right now. But look in the mirror. If it was you, what would God be exposing? And then it, it, the word said that from, from November to May, God was going to restore and bring, bring the, the zeal back to the church. And we need that. We got to get out from under the darkness, get in the light, and run. Amen? Being tempted is not a sin. How many of you ever get tempted? Being tempted is not a sin. It's what you do with that temptation. That's what matters. If you confess how the enemy's trying to tempt you, you expose his plans. So I know we don't like to say, well, I, I've been getting these thoughts. We don't like to tell anybody your thoughts, you know, because your thoughts might be evil. Well, if the enemy's planting evil thoughts in your mind, I, I told Delana some thoughts I had the other day. She said, yeah, you need to get saved again. <laughs> I'm like, really? Come on. 
it, we were joking with each other. But it was, it was just funny, you know. You, just, you know, sometimes we just need to come and repent and get, get it right, amen? If you're getting tempted, don't, don't meditate on the temptation. Give it over to the Lord. Expose it. Tell somebody. The, the devil's been tempting me with this. If the devil's tempting you, that doesn't make you a bad person, does it? No. Realize that. It doesn't make you a bad person. But just deal with the temptation so it doesn't become a desire so that you don't take it. Because I've shown you two places in Scripture. They saw it. They desired it. They took it. That's how sin works. Lust of the eyes. The pride of life keeps us from telling anybody that it's going on. But you need to tell somebody. Talk to a trust, trustworthy person. Don't just go to anybody. Because remember, that's why the, the only 12% of the people really could talk to anybody about the abortion issue because people run around and talk. Sorry they do. Make sure you go to a trustworthy person. You know you can trust them. Don't set yourself up for more turmoil. So, <laughs> I put in my note here, when you hear what you're saying, flee from it. <laughs> when you hear what you're saying, flee from it. So, what you see, what you desire, what you take, it all begins with a glance. What does God hate? When we do the things that God hates, are we not taking a stand against God? I want you to think about that for now. I'm going to say it again. When we do the things that God hates, are we not taking a stand against God? I remember the Israelites walking in the wilderness. And the Lord had already said that there was only going to be a certain age at that time that would be allowed into the promised land. And if you weren't of that certain age, you were going to die in the wilderness. There was nothing they could do about it. They were going to, if you, they were over that age limit, they were going to die in the wilderness. They would not receive the promise. But that's not for us. That's not what we have today. Today we have great opportunity to cast down those imaginations, to get unstuck if we've been stuck, and know true freedom. To know freedom in Jesus Christ. Amen. All we have to do is repent of our sins, confess, and be healed. You don't have to run around and do hoops and, you know, and, and stand on the tables and shout from the mountaintops. You got to repent for the things that you know you've been doing that God hates and just make a commitment to God. I'm repenting. I'm turning from them. I'm not going to participate in them anymore. I'm going the other direction. I mean, I'm not going to stay here. I'm not going to be stuck. You know, we need to know who we are in Jesus. We need to know what those things are that have a hold on us. We need to take authority over them. We need to cast them down. We need to repent. And we need to arise and keep moving forward with God. We can't allow the enemy the ground because there's coming a time and so many people are saying it right now that there's going to be a line drawn in the sand and you're going to have to really decide who you serve. I don't think being on the side of the things God hates is going to be good for you. I think you need to be on the other side. I don't think we should be participating in the things that God hates. I think God has a better plan for us. I think God has another way for us. And it's just us tapping into who He is and then being honest with yourself. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today as your people. Father, we are here today because we love you. And we know, Lord Jesus, that you have a plan for us. 
Father, and I pray that, Lord, your plan would be so alive inside of each one of us. That, Lord, that we'd forsake our own way of doing things and we'd pick up our cross and follow Jesus. That we would come after Jesus with all of our heart, soul, and mind. We not allow the enemy to deceive us or get strongholds in our life, but, Lord, we'd cast down those things. I've talked about three things. Seeing, desiring, and taking. And maybe you're here today, you say, Pastor Ron, I've seen some things that I wish I could erase. If that's you today, just raise your hand. You've seen things you wish you could just erase out of your mind. That you don't want it in there anymore. Amen, amen, amen. Amen, 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 amen. And maybe you're here today, you said, some of those things that I've seen have, have turned into desires in my life, and i I've been battling with these desires that I know they're not godly, but it's been a real battle. Maybe there's some desires that have been birthed out of what you saw in your life and you're trying, you're fighting against it right now. If that's you, just raise your hand right now. Amen, 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 amen. Amen. Maybe you've taken hold of that desire. And you just know that you need to repent of it today. You need to just cast it down. If that's you, I want you to just raise your hand right now. Amen, 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 amen. So let's do that. Why don't we all pray this prayer? Your Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would just wash my eyes. Cleanse from what I've seen. Lord, renew a right spirit within me. I cast down all imaginations, all desires of the flesh, and I pick up my cross today. Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I repent of those things that I've done. And why don't you just take a moment and tell him what they are right now. Just confess them to the Father right now. bring freedom to us to save us out of darkness and we just cast down those things today in the name of Jesus Lord we just pray that you just have your way in us from this day forward Lord old things are passed away and all things are becoming new there's a newness and a refreshing for us today in who we are in Jesus Jesus name and everybody said yeah yeah hallelujah <laughs> glory to God now all we got to do is just walk it out amen seeing desiring and taking let that sink in on a regular basis with you because it'll direct what you what you watch what you allow into your eye gate